Hello, it's Ian McCauley here and I'm back with another interview. I've got someone very special with me today and uh, he's a very popular fella. I'll tell you how popular he is. Mickey Mouse wears a Tommy Kelly watch. And anybody that's under 50 wouldn't catch that joke. But anyway, here we go. Tommy, talk to me about... First of all, thanks very much for letting me do this interview with you. But uh, talk to me about what it was like for you growing up in the New Lodge. Ian, it was... As you do, as you're, you're a kid growing up in the New Lodge. You get in there, talking and dying and running about. Good childhood. You were born in 77, so was it the hell of the Troubles? Did that have any impact on you? Well, even to be honest with you, it didn't. Because I get home everybody. So I do. I get home everybody. And I'm still getting home everybody. So right. we're brought up that way, to be honest with you, Nick. Many siblings do you have? Brothers have, and sisters? Uh, three brothers. Michael, Martin, Jackie. And two sisters, Maureen and Roshi. So do. Right. And what school did you go to? What primary school? I went to, uh, Oh, you went to Barnegie, he was secondary no, school. Did you not know? No, I went to uh, let me. Down the road. Went to uh, the Anton Road. Don't worry, don't worry about no, that. No, uh, no, so talk to me about Brothers. Christian Brothers. Christian Brothers. Right. Yeah. Right. So talk to me about some of your uh uh Ducking and dying, uh, some of your uh, antics growing no, up. As you get into it, messed about with being in the wrong crowd. Well, thank God I was always in a good wee crowd, even to be honest with you. But Who I was your mates? It was Eamon Smith and Jim Smith. So it was. And it was Louis Campbell. And it was Paddy, Paddy Pigeon, you call them. See you that? Right. Right. See that? So, uh, you were saying to me in 1987, you had a bad accident. Had a bad accident. Talk to me about that. I had a bad accident in the New Lodge, so I did. But we were, as you, you know, you were kids and we were out doing a bit of, trying to get a few quid. And uh, we broke into this building site, the steel cover, and a uh, steel beam hit me in the back of the head. And it was an intensive care for about two months. So I was, I was in the hospital for about six months. You were actually clinically dead at one point, wasn't you? I was clinically dead, I mean, so was. Wow. So was, yeah. Wow. So, uh, you and Mickey done a bit of boxing for the star. Mickey had a bit of me? boxing for the star. So how did you get involved in boxing? Talk I to me about that. I got involved in boxing, you know. But just, I never go in the room until when I was a kid. Up to see Mickey one day for something. And they were moved. Something happened in the room until. And they went to the Dapper's Club in Pilot Street. And I went down to the Dapper's Club one night in Pilot Street to see him. And he said, Why don't you go down to anybody with a train? And I says, I will. And I met a good fella, a legend in Blackton, a guy called Steve McCluskey, who's a gentleman. And it just, I walked him around and I stayed with him. Right, well, the New Lodge, uh, there was two big boxing clubs in the New Lodge. There was a the Holy Family and there was the Star ABC. There was also some great boxers from that area, you know, the McStravix, Jimmy Carson, who beat the great Alphonse Salimi. Uh, in fact, one or two of the McStravix were world rated as professionals. You had the stories, you had the laps, and you had the uh, Harding Street gym at the bottom of the New Lodge, which produced an undisputed, undefeated world champion in Rindy Monaghan. Uh, tell you a wee story about there, uh, there no running water in the gym, so Rindy's brother Tommy. Uh, it was Tommy told me this, that he used to get jugs and he used to go next door to get the jugs filled and that's how he met his wife. Yes. So you said to me getting involved in boxing changed your life. Yeah, it did. You know, to be honest with you, it did. It changed my life because, I mean, you, you get in these wee gangs and whatever else and these, they got a new little drill where I came from. You don't know where you're going to end up. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? You're going to end up in a joy there. You're gonna end up drinking. You're gonna end up taking drugs or something. Well, thank God, I was brought up where there was no drugs or drink in the house. Yes. Getting back to that uh, brain injury, you said you, you still wore a steel plate. 
Yeah, still have a steam kit. Do you have any seizures or any? No. Is that is all, everything a million percent? Everything is hundred percent. Praise the Lord for that. Fantastic. Uh, so as you say, there was a split in Newington. You were at Newington, and it was a split there, and Paddy Fitzsimmons left, and you and your brother Mickey went with him, uh, and you started up the uh, Dockers ABC. Well, we did the Dockers, so we did even. We started up the Dockers Club, so we did. Right. And Paddy Fitz, of course, a uh, great boxer in his day, went to the uh, 1964 Tokyo Olympics. Mm -hmm. And he also had a great win over uh, former World Lightweight Champion and legend Ken Buchanan. Yeah, what a win that was. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I actually trained there for three months in 1991. And it was a great wee stable of boxers. You had, uh, you had Richard Brannigan, Ronnie Bow, Patrick Mowbray. It's some great... You know, precocious talents there. Yeah. Uh, great wee gym, but I was there and Paddy was very, very good to me. And I had a sparred, of course, with uh, the legend Stephen McCluskey. I'd had some great sparring with Stephen. And Stephen was a good boxer, wasn't he? Very, very good boxer, even so he was. And yes, you ended up, you joined John Breen's gym. I joined John Breen's gym. I went down to Breen's gym. We had a kid from Tyrone, Paddy Rowland. And he was training in. Brains Gym for the Irish Seniors and Paddy Fitzsimmons said to me, Will you bring him down? And he says, I did on. I went down and the rest is history. The rest is history. So it is. Uh, well, uh, I'll throw some names to you and uh, let me know what you think, uh, both as a person and as a boxer. Uh, Neil Sinclair. Great guy. What a puncher. So he was. Uh, let me see, Jim Rock. No, a great guy. Tough. Very, very tough and durable. Eamon McGee. What can you say? Just Eamon McGee was one of the best guys I ever met. So he is. Because every Christmas, every him and his wife, Mary, and his kids, and God rest young Eamon, came down to my mummy's house and daddy's house. We both have flowers and chocolates. So, what can I say about him? That's very nice. That's very nice. Uh, Paul McCluskey? I'm trying to think here some of the guys. Paul some McCluskey, yeah. European champion. European champion. Fought on your con for the World Tape. Fought on your con for the World Tape. Yeah, and there must have been other great boxers come through as regards to sparring partners. Suman Nelson and all was in the gym. Suman Nelson was in the gym and met him. Right. John the way. John Lowe, he was another great boxer, another I just forgot, friend. sorry about that John. Ray Close. Danny Juma. Danny Juma. Oscar Chaga. Bernard Chaga was a coach. Of course they come over from Panama and they're, they still, they're still Panama. here to this day. They're here to this day. Right. And you've got Stephen Hawking. Yeah. Glenn McLaren. Glenn McLaren. I mean, a great wee gym and a uh, small wee gym, even. Above the Monaco Bar. Above the Monaco Bar. Uh, Belfast City Centre. Yeah. Uh, great time in your life. It was, right. yeah. Best times of my life. Even. Great. And you were over quite a lot. I mean, you were there when McGee fought Paul Burke and you were involved, you were in the corner. Uh, talk to me about that. Go away with Eamon McGee. Was a good highlight. Right. Because you were a kid. You were going to that country. You were going to a farm, a dirty, dirty, dirty place, and you had to make it your home. And it was brilliant. Mm. It was brilliant because when you were a kid growing up in the New Lodge, even, you were watching the lady yourself on TV, saw him story, and you were going, I want to be in a game on Sunday. And you were going, and you were getting the boxing training camps with Eamon McGee. And it was just different. You said to me that he, he stubbed a cigarette out in your bare leg one time. Well, <laughs> that was out in Crumlin, funny enough, for the second Paul Burke fight. We were, uh, we were out in Crumlin still, and uh, we were sitting having something to eat. Breakfast it was even, and God rest Mike Callaghan. He, uh, he was up the stairs, but he came down, and nobody heard him coming down the stairs, and he opened the door, and he says, Eamon, and he just, <laughs> right in my leg. And I was like, <laughs> Right in the leg, he didn't even say sorry, like. Oh, uh, well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Wow. So, uh, so you're uh, 
You just told me another wee funny wee story about the going for the, the juice. Well, and everyone there going for the juice, we had a, a great gym. One day Neil Sinclair would have brought the juice, or Mickey would have brought the juice, or John Breen. And one day it was certain fellas turning to buy the juice. A guy from Dublin known as the Pink Panther, Jim Rapp. And pff, your bag was a gullible kid, like, and he came into the gym. He says, Tommy, you go and get the juice today. He says, I did on. He says, there's 20 pounds in my pocket, you go and get it. So I went up and I got it and took a 20 pound in his pocket. Went and got the juice and six tins of Lucas here. And it goes round and it takes 20 pound out. Here's me. What's going on here? And I had 20 pound of meal too. So I took my 20 pound out and Jim, Jim Rack's 20 pound, that's who it was. And I looked. And Jim Rack's 20 pound was very tan. So I, I ended up giving it and I looked back at Jim Rack and I said, oh, Jim, your 20 pound was very tan, very black. And mine's was alright. He says, Tommy, the Queen's only out there getting their photograph. Talk, she was only back from Barbados. <laughs> so, <laughs> whatever he was up to, you know, he was up to. Yeah. yeah. So uh, talk to me about Mickey. Mickey's a great guy, your brother Mickey. Brother uh, Mickey's a great guy. Isn't he a wonderful fella? Wonderful guy. And he's been involved with the club. Uh, he's been involved with the club for years. Since his formation, since yeah. the Dockers started. Yeah, since the Dockers opened. Yeah. He's been early. And he's done a bit of boxing himself. He did a bit of boxing himself, so he did. So talk to me, uh, in all your uh, time as a boxing coach and being around boxers and who would be, and I'm talking amateur and professional here, in your experience, who would be the best boxer? that you've been involved with? What I've been involved with? But never... Now, even just, a, you know, who was the best puncher? Oh, how did I? Neil Sinclair. Neil Sinclair, right. I thought you were going to say that. Who was the best boxer? Best boxer. Or who was the toughest? It'd have to be McGee. Well, even to be honest with you, no. No, okay. How would say Jim Rack? Right. For tough? Yeah. McGee, smart. Yeah. But Jim Rapp was tough, 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 you know. Right. Because it's funny as you say, I remember one day John Bring was in England or something. And he said to me, Tell me you and the Jim Rapp. He says, I did and all. He says, McGee sparring Jim Rapp today. And what a sparring. You know? Right. And then Neil Sinclair would have been in that wee triangle. He would have been in the triangle. Great well. sparring for the feeling. So he would have. Yeah. Talk to me about John Breen. John Breen's. What do you say about JB? He was the boss. Do you know what I mean? And of course he came from the, the Eastwoods. Uh, he came from Eastwoods. Yeah, started <coughs> his own so gym up. Started his own gym up. Produced his own world champions. Produced his own world champions. Uh -huh. Sorry, yeah. Just from the thought that the, the glorious period in their boxing yeah. uh, history was coming to an end. Yeah. He started a new He one. started a new one. Sorry, yeah. John Green's a gentleman. I owe John a title that. Right. So I do. Right, right. You knew John Rocky McGranigan too, didn't you? Well, funny enough, the <laughs> never... You could have a few stories about John. Right. What a character. John, what a character. And I remember one day I was down in the gym even, and uh, you were in the man going up the stairs and I was down about what was the key and the doors and I opened it and this fellow just fell right in and he says, mate, you can't sit there. You have to move. I'm knocking John Breen. He says, mate, who are you? He says, Rocky McGrann. I always wanted to meet Rocky McGonagall, you know, because mm -hmm. you hear so much about him. Yeah. What a great fighter he was from the Shangle Road. Yeah. And I went upstairs and he says, John, there's a guy downstairs. He's looking to see you. He said, John, what does he look like? I said, John, bashed him whatever else, bit of a drinker. He says, that's the great Rocky McGonagall. Aye, such a sad, such a sad. ignominious ending for yeah, him. So John, he threw himself off. Nola Westlink, the Westlink that's trying right. to commit suicide. Jumped out of the doctor's car. A doctor surgeon doctor who, surgeon. Perform, who performed, performed life saving. You couldn't make it up, like, could no, you? you couldn't make it up. And uh, yeah, I like John. Uh, I was sparring one time in Eastwoods and he happened to mention to me, we had our own keys for Eastwoods, yeah, you see. Right. And he happened to mention to me that he touched for women right. in the town and brought them back to the gym. You know, and as I was getting into the ring to spar McGuigan, I think it was, and uh, he turned around and says, Me, I'm on it. Well, it isn't just uh, sparring goes on in that ring. He was in plan that he was having sex with the girls in the ring. And, you know, what a legend. He was a big, good looking fella, middleweight. He'd, uh, I think his mother, his father was Scottish, 
So he had that lovely uh, twang in, in, in his voice. Uh, yeah. You wouldn't think he's a boxer, yeah. But a, a great guy, lovely guy, John. Uh, yeah. yeah. One night I was working in uh, the Eglin town and he came looking for Paul Douglas and his face was all biased up. Paul Douglas had apparently given him a bit of a going over the night before. But he was back He was back for another go. But thank God Paul Douglas wasn't working that night. But, uh, you know, game as he was, you know, he he, he wanted another go, another rub uh, uh, Paul Douglas. Uh, so are you still involved with attackers today? I'm still involved with attackers today, I mean, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, and you have a great connection with Raptin. I have a great connection with the Raptin team. So, uh, Come back, how long? 25 years? 25 years. For, yeah, yeah. And you just go over there and they come over here on a regular basis. Yeah, so it is. And you've made some great contacts over there, Tommy. Made some great contacts over there, even, yeah. Some of your uh, celebrity friends, Ronnie O'Sullivan. Ronnie O'Sullivan. Frank Bruno. Big Frank. Hi. Uh, I'll tell you a wee story about Tommy before uh, I end this interview. Uh, I was sitting in the house one day and I got a phone call from Tommy. And he says, Eamon, can you get down to the Europa Hotel? And I says, why, what, what, what's this all about? He says, Eamon, just trust me, do you trust me? I says, yeah, he says, well, come on down to the Europa Hotel. So I went down, more intrigued as to what was going to happen than anything else. And uh, I was outside and I rang him, he says, Eamon, come on into the bar. And when I went into the bar, there he was with Ricky Hatton. And he says, Eamon, I've arranged for you to have lunch with Ricky Hatton. And it was just beautiful and uh, we spent about an hour talking. And the Tyson Fury was in the room, Carl Frampton was in the room, uh, Josh Warrington, uh, Billy Joe Saunders, they were all there and they all knew Tucker well and they were all saying hello to him. But uh, we got sandwiches, we got lunch anyway and I uh, had a great talk with Ricky. But the next day I happened to see Tucker and I says, Tucker, I feel a wee bit guilty about you having to buy them sandwiches and stuff like that. Come on, I'll take you for a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and a sandwich. And uh, Tommy says, no, don't worry about that, I mean, I put that all in Ricky's room, room number. He left paid for that. <laughs> and then as we, when we went for the coffee, Tommy's phone rang. And he was talking away and then he said to me, Eamon, a fella here wants to have a word with you. And it was Glenn McCrory, uh, the former World Cruiserweight Champion and Sky uh, TV pundit. So I thought to myself, Tommy, you're an absolute legend. So there you are. Uh, is there anything you want to say, Tommy, before we, we end this? Is there anybody you want to thank? or? I want to thank Paddy Fitzsimmons and Stephen McCluskey and John Brady. Right. Because only for Evans. Right. I wonder if Matt, who and Matt needed to meet. But you had a, boxing's give you a great life. Great life, yeah. Great life. Met some great people. Yeah. And you're a very popular guy. I've seen that. I've seen how people love to be around you and love to, you know, yeah. have a chat with you. Yeah. Uh, Tommy, thanks very much for uh, talking to me today. I really appreciate it. God bless you, my friend. Good work. God bless you. Thank you, man. Thank you. God bless. So a few photos here with Tommy Kelly's with Glenn McCrory here. This guy is actually Ali Campbell, the lead singer of UB40. Harold Bomber Graham. George Groves, Al Bernstein, the famous uh, U.S. sports presenter, Ram Burnett, Richie Woodall, David Hay, Eamon Holmes, Dave Boy McCauley and Eamon Lachran, Charlie Magray, Ricky Hatton, that's uh, Carl Fromm, I'm sorry. Where's where Hatton go? Where's Hatton now? And Paddy McGuire.